My name is Nick, and I'm the founder of the Digital Tourism Think Tank. And I'm really pleased to be here with you to talk to you about Snapchat and the Snapchat generation. So my very first question for all of you is, who in this room, just a show of hands, who in this room is already on Snapchat? Wow. OK. So let's just cancel the session, because it was an educational session on Snapchat. There's no need to teach you anything. No, only joking. We're going to have some really interesting discussions later on and some really interesting perspectives to start with. The second question I have, show your hand again if you use Snapchat in your marketing activities. Not bad at all. OK, we're going to have some questions from you guys and some uh, reactions later on. That's really good to hear, because honestly, I speak all over the world, and usually I get maybe one hand that is uh, ready to say we use Snapchat. So this is something that's really exciting. So we're going to talk about the Snapchat generation. That means not only talking about Snapchat, but talking about the Gen Zs, what they're doing, how they're using media, how they're consuming media, and how they're interacting with each other. So let's get started. First of all, just to say that this session will have three parts. The first will be me. I'll be talking to you about the Snapchat generation from my perspective, how I see it. Uh, actually, as a consumer, as a regular person. And uh, then I will introduce Danish Faran, who is a great inspiration to me. He is what I think is the most innovative person in Dubai, maybe in the Middle East. Um, so you'll hear what he has to say in a little bit. Uh, he's certainly not short of creativity, and he really, really gets where consumer marketing is going. And he works with some amazing brands and also with some government initiatives, which he's going to talk about later on. So let's get started. And then the third part, I'm very sorry, the third part will be uh, a really interesting discussion where I'm also inviting you guys to be part of that. So already start thinking about what it is that you want to know about Gen Z. What do you think, uh, what are your opinions and what do you want our take on it for? So get thinking and we'll get to that a little bit later. So last thing before I get into my slides is do tweet us. My team in the UK have now woken up, so um, they will respond. Uh, we're not on Twitter 24-7, like everybody tells you to be. We're on generally sort of uh, 8 to 8. And uh, unfortunately, that means for the first session we had on 360 content, nobody responded because they were in bed. But uh, now you can guarantee they will respond. So definitely test them. I want to know if they're doing their job properly. And uh, share your comments and thoughts. We want your opinions on this. So use the hashtag ATM2016 and share your opinions. Right. Let's get started. So, Generation Z, and I'm going to talk to you about what they crave. This is from my perspective. The first thing, what are we talking about? So we're talking about young people here. We're talking about up to 17 years old. This isn't the millennial generation. This is the generation that comes after the millennials. They have some really, really, really interesting characteristics. The first thing to say is that the millennials were digital first generation, and now this is a mobile first generation. And that is quite a key difference, because the difference between digital and mobile is mobile is personal, mobile is part of how we live and breathe. So that means it really changes our behavior as human beings. It's a really significant part of the population. They don't have much money right now, but they will do. And that's what you have to think about. You have to look a little bit long term, have a bit of a vision when you think about future markets. One of the statistics which I dug up, which I think is really, really exciting, 61% want to start their own business when you ask them what they want to do when they're older. Now, that is absolutely incredible. That tells us that we are breeding here a generation of entrepreneurs. That is actually very significant for you as a marketeer because the way you talk to an entrepreneur will be quite different to the way you talk to an employee. So just think about that. They also care about some really important issues. So this was a US uh, survey that show that they care about global warming, the cost of education, texting while driving, not sure what that's about, <laughs> and gender equality. So that's just to give you a little bit of an idea. Now, if we start thinking about the difference between the millennials and the Gen Zs, here is what I came up with. And I think Danish is going to really build on this later on when he starts talking about then how they use technology and then actually how we need to really work with this generation differently. So first of all, my generation, I'm just squeezing in the millennial generation. That's very uh, lucky for me. 
Um, you know, we grew up and we played with toys, actual toys, you know, like physical Lego blocks. Um, so the guys over at the Dubai parks need to start thinking about how the digital experience will play out there. But today's generation, who here has kids? Or nephews or nieces, any, any little kids in your family, yeah. And you know that they are addicted to their screens. They know their way around their screens better than their parents. And they know exactly which folder you hid all the games in. They even know your pin code and they'll unlock your phone. So they're very good in an emergency in that sense. Uh, but they're also a bit of a liability. So that's a big, big difference. That's how they play. Also, for me, when this iPod came out, it was amazing. I was one of the first to buy it. I don't think this is not the very first iPod. I think it's the third generation. But this was the first one I got. And for me, that was exciting. It was really exciting, in particular because of the colors. The, yeah, it was great. But this was a revolution for millennials. Having digital music was a revolution. So taking CDs and putting them onto a device, that was absolutely amazing. But now we're talking about Spotify generation. And that's actually a really big difference because this is all about how they get content, how they consume content. And the big difference between Spotify and an iPod is one, you load your music on and you choose what you want. The other, you stream and you just say, ah, oh, I want that, I'm gonna have it, I'm gonna get it right now. It's a completely different way of thinking about when you want things. You don't go and purchase, you just have it at your disposal whenever you want. I do apologize for the language here, that's why I have abbreviated it, but I think it maybe sums up a little bit the uh, texting language which has evolved in recent years. And, um, you know, my generation, we learned how to use Google Maps. Of course, now everybody uses Google Maps. It's not a revolution anymore, but it was a revolution. And I actually have a colleague who is my youngest colleague, and she actually has no idea what a London A to Z is. She has absolutely no idea. I asked her, and she said, is it like Rough Guides? And she actually then could not find a street. I gave her the book, and I said, can you find this street? And she could not find it. She had no idea how to use it. Just think about that. That is absolutely crazy. They have no idea how to use a paper map. Now, what's really interesting here is how we work with content. So millennials, they love to curate content. They love to gather, pick things together. A perfect example is brides-to-be. When they're planning a wedding, they use a site like Pinterest, and they put together all the little ideas. They curate everything. They pull the content, and then they go and plan. We also often approach tourism and travel like this. We pull all our ideas together, and then we start to choose the ones we like. And we're very influenced by influencers, ambassadors, opinion makers. So this is really important. This generation, and I just took this from uh, Snapchat directly, it's a generation of creators. So if you want to create content which is engaging for them, they then want to build on top of that. They don't want to just have that content. They want to play with it and do something funny. So this is just a geo filter adding uh, McDonald's fries to a simple video on Snapchat. Also, this is a generation that communicates in a different way. So Snapchat's founder describes Snapchat as a conversation channel, as a messaging app. It is Snapchat. And often we, as marketeers, who maybe don't understand this well enough, we think it's a social network. We think it's a place to put photos in the same way that Facebook is. Facebook is like a digital photo album that you share with your friends and family and you tell them to go and look at it. Whereas the other is about actually talking with images and it doesn't really matter if they stay or they go. Now, this is my, uh, one of my favorite things. Does anyone know Project Magazine or remember Project Magazine, I should say? Nobody, yes, Danish. So, Project is, uh, it was the first digital iPad app and it was actually created by Richard Branson. And it was seen as a revolution, and it was really, really good. It was an interactive magazine. That is the millennial generation. That is old stuff. Interactive magazines on an iPad, it's not something that's for this generation. This generation, again, we go back to content on demand, following channels and getting content, binge-watching content. But I just want to kind of bring it back a bit. This is um, Cosmopolitan magazine, very standard. I've never read it, but I believe it's very popular amongst girls. And as you can see here, it's a lot of colors, a lot of fun stuff, it's very funky, you know, it, it's what Cosmopolitan magazine is. We often associate Snapchat as something that's a bit silly, a bit stupid, it's something that kids are doing.
But we also have to remember that this generation talks in a different way, and what inspires them is also different. And actually, if we look at teen magazines, the way in which content presented is actually not so different at all, the stylistic approach. So we can consider that they will also grow up, and then we'll see different uses. This is also inside Project Magazine. I thought this was good because it's a guideline on how to use an interactive magazine on an iPad. That's, you know, that's early stuff there. And here we have Cosmopolitan Magazine on the, on Snapchat. So it just shows you how different content can be displayed and how interactive it is. In this example, you actually just swipe, 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 swipe. It's the same as flicking through a magazine. And then you stop at the content that you like. And then you can play and interact with content. So I won't con <laughs> keep playing that. We, we want to get to the discussion. I'm going to show you this quick video, because this is absolutely not a commercial video. These are literally a group of young people who decided to set themselves on a mission. But it gives you a little bit of a taste of a Snapchat. And it should give you a little bit of a marketing idea as well. Just a second, we just need to plug in the sound. <laughs> Short, so I'm going to keep moving. But what I wanted to show you is this is young people going on a road trip. They're going around LA searching for all the geo filters. So for those of you who don't use Snapchat, really quick introduction. When you create content, you can add a layer, a filter, something creative, a little bit funky like you saw there, which just tells people where you are. It's a great marketing opportunity. But this is young people loving that and actually looking all over the city for those geo filters. So if you're a destination, just think about what you could really do with that. Now here is another way to think about this generation. This is also a generation of creatives and creators. So actually when you want to think about how to engage audiences, this is a really interesting example. Well, I've seen that other um, calls on the middle have new time, but I don't know what the problem, and I want to do the Okay, so geo filters are a huge opportunity for brands to tap into. It's something you can do very easily. You see here kids doing it. Think about the process of doing it and actually involve your community to be part of that process. Then you'll have a much bigger marketing effect. And as I was saying in the 360 content session, being the first, being an early at something has a huge PR value as well. So just think about that. Now, if you don't understand Snapchat or you just don't understand what the big deal is, I think the first thing to consider is that in the US, 85% of people at college are using it every day. And that's compared to around 11% using Facebook every day. So that's a really important number to think about. This is a, a, serious, a serious, serious channel. The next thing is, I, um, this is a cousin of my girlfriend. And we were just having a family dinner. And then I saw her using Snapchat. And I said, you've got to tell me how this works. So I connected my phone. I recorded it for you. I'm not going to play the audio, but I can send you guys the link if you're interested. And I just asked her to talk me through everything. Tell me everything you know about Snapchat. And the first thing she said is, look, I'm not an expert in this. And she's told me everything you could possibly want to know. So if you want to know about Snapchat, if you want to know how young people are communicating through Snapchat, and if you also want to understand how brands are using it, just grab a young person and get them to show it to you. And then get into it yourself. OK, so I'm reaching the end of my part. Um, but I wanted to tell you that it's also really important that you really get hands-on yourself. This is one of those channels which you really won't get unless you start. 
So start using it, find four or five other people who are using it, and then really just get into it. And then you will start to understand how it works. We do an event in, uh, well, we did an event last uh, March in the Faroe Islands called the Digital Tourism Content Campus. And we sent marketeers, 100 marketeers out to create loads and loads of content. So this is just an example of something that was created by somebody for the first time to tell their story of that trip. I'm only going to play a short part where they search for the seal woman, uh, but it's, a, it's, a really, it's really interesting to see how content develops. And it's all vertical content, by the way, because it's on the mobile. Okay, so I won't play the whole thing. What I will say is, with Snapchat, if you don't like the content you see, you just tap, tap, tap. So it doesn't mean you watch every single snap. You just keep going. So it's an incredibly addictive. And when you have really good content, this is probably 50-50, when you have really good content, it's really compelling and you keep following that brand. Just think about whether you're a hotel, whether you're an airline, whether you're an airport, or a destination. Just think about, oops. Think about all the stories that exist within your experience. And think about all the people who can tell those stories. It's something that's really exciting. So, that's me talking about Snapchat. Now, I'm very pleased to welcome to the stage Danish Ferran. Danish, as I said, is a pure inspiration for me. He's somebody who really, really understands the consumer landscape. He also understands digital, and he also understands brands. So, who better to tell us about how we tap into and engage this generation than Danish. Please welcome to the stage. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Can you hear me all the way at the back? All right. Hey. Uh, Nick's introductions are blown over the top. They're a bit like using emoji when describing something. So I would take that with a, with a pinch of salt and pepper. Um, all right. Does that work? Is that thank you for me? Okay, all good. So I'm here to talk about Generation Z. Uh, just in case you're wondering, I'm not of Generation Z. Uh, I'm very much uh, within the millennial uh, zone. Did you say you squeezed into the millennials or you weren't actually in it? Uh, okay, uh, all right. <laughs> um, so my name is Danish Farhan. And you notice there's something on screen. That's something that you, we use quite often, no? Now, the way I express myself is something like that. Now, does anyone know what that means? Good, because neither do I. I'm feeling very happy face, happy face, dolphin. Uh, and I know this isn't unusual because a lot of us actually receive things that look like this. But I know for a fact that I'm very lost. I had to look up on Google what that symbol meant. The girl in the, in the pink shirt that sort of whacks her face, it means I'm lost. So I don't actually know why those emoji are on there, but it's to tell you that I'm going to tell you why. Um, just a little bit about who we are. So I run a boutique consulting firm. We crafted Dubai's first national tourism brand about seven years ago. Um, we launched the Formula One out of Abu Dhabi about eight years ago. We designed the FIFA bid uh, for the government of Qatar. We worked with them for about two years. Um, We've built a unified strategy to create art experiences across Dubai for the government of Dubai. We've built something called the Happiness Initiative, which is linked to Smart Dubai and is now connected to Her Excellency Ahoud Al Rumi, who is the Minister of Happiness. Have you heard of the Minister of Happiness in the UAE? All right, I'm going to tell you some more about that in a bit. Um, we also had an incredible opportunity of destination marketing the hell out of Mars. Um, so we essentially branded UAE's mission to Mars, and we had to create a proposition that was as inspiring to future astronauts as it was to the global academic sector. Uh, and this was a, a great deal of fun. Um, 
Have you heard of the Drone Pre? Yes? How many of you have heard of it? Can you raise your hands? That's not bad. So the Drone Pre was held a couple of months ago for the first time ever with a million dollar prize where you literally go in and watch drones racing at 100 kilometers an hour. Uh, next year, the drones are going to be 25% bigger. The year after that, they'll be 25% bigger until we can actually sit on them and race. This is the kind of stuff that appeals to the Generation Zs, not the millennials, because we're too scared to sit on a drone. And lastly, we've had the privilege of crafting the official identity of His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum, uh, the Vice President and Prime Minister of the UAE. Enough about me. Let's talk about Generation Z. I think we all acknowledge that they're a completely different species. Would you agree? Yes? Anyone from Generation Z here? I mean, ladies, you can put your hands up. It's, uh, it's OK. Um, now, how do they behave in the Middle East is something I want to cover. Feel free to collect your questions, because Nick and I are going to have a, a sit down, and he's going to take a jab at me for, for the things I've just said. Um, the difference between millennials and Generation Z requires us to establish what millennials actually mean. So let's do that very quickly. Have you seen uh, this data before? I've quoted the sources of everything that I'm referencing here so that you can look it up. <laughs> All right, so it's on the left bottom of my slides. Feel free to, to take that down. Millennials, at an average, use two screens. They express with text. They create things. They're future focused. They're realists. And they work for success. Generation Z use an average of five screens. They express with images, like the happy face, happy face dolphin. They share things. They focus on the present. They're optimists. And they want to be discovered. Now, this tells you very clearly the distinction between the cultural makeup and the psychological makeup of the Generation Z versus the millennials. Let's. Uh, talk about the big problem. How many of you represent brands here? Re show of hands? OK. Now, you obviously want to build brand loyalty, correct? Now, the problem with Generation Z is they couldn't care less about a brand. They actually care about value, and they care about value because they want bragging rights. They want to be able to go out and show off that they got a good deal, and they only had to Google it for about 11 minutes before they found it. As opposed to, look, I bought a pair of Nikes, or I bought a, a new Swatch, or whatever. Now, Swatch is a very millennial reference. Uh, obviously, now it's an Apple Watch. Um, the Middle Eastern Generation Zs have a significantly higher disposable income than their global counterparts. What does that mean? It means that they're in the driving seat. They have a lot of money to spend. They're not brand loyal. And you have to find a way to communicate with them. Connectivity with disease is 100%. It's not optional. Within the millennials, you still sort of debate whether I'll get myself a social plan on my phone or I'll get myself a full-blown 4G connection. With the, with the Generation Zs, you're given one of these connections by your parents because that's how we keep track of our kids. Um, they have far greater self-esteem and they've got a uh, good dose of humility. This was the most surprising fact for me. Um, so apparently, millennials, such as myself, have very low self-esteem, turns out. Um, and so, so, so Generation Z has evolved since then because they're a lot more confident of the access that they have, and they're a lot more confident of the knowledge that they're able to gather, as opposed to the generation that was mine. This is a problem. They lack situational awareness. What does that mean? They know how to use Google Maps. They don't know how to go about finding street signs if, even without using the A to Z. You cannot read uh, street signs. How many of you are based in Dubai? How many of you have been here for over 10 years? OK, so I'm going to speak to you. How do you describe where your office is? The way I describe where my office is or where my villa is, I say, do you know, you know Wessel Street? Yeah. You count three garbage bins. You take a left from Medina supermarket, and then you stop behind the tree. And that is literally the way I will text or WhatsApp my directions. So it's not uncommon in Dubai for us to not understand signage uh, uh, anyway. But situational awareness means that they are more involved in documenting what's happening right now rather than experiencing it. 
the millennials would document it, but they would still keep one eye on the experience. So this is a problem. Unless you're able to create content that is complementary to the experience right here and right now, you've lost uh, Generation Z because they're already talking about the next thing they're going to go after. There is another very fascinating thing about Generation Z. They define all of their decisions in life, whether it's a small decision like you know, uh, what to shop or where to travel on purpose. So 84% of all millennials that were surveyed in the Middle East uh, within this study um, actually cited that they were traveling because of a purpose, either because they wanted to go out and volunteer or because they wanted to go out and understand something more about the social fabric of a certain society as opposed to, oh, I'm going to go and chill, which is a very millennial thing. So there is a huge difference. This leads me to happy face, right? Sorry, I keep bringing this up. I hate that symbol, but I think it drives my point home. Um, should we talk about happiness for a second? Uh, I'm going to deviate. So Snapchat generation, great. But that was a way to get everyone into the room. I'm going to talk about Snapchat generation, but let's talk about happiness. OK. Um, what's interesting is that happiness is often a liberal art subject. I will beg your pardon, because I'm going to get a bit scientific over the next four slides, but bear with me. Feel free to photograph this and post it and share it. Um, we've been working on happiness initiatives within the UAE for a couple of years now. And we realized the moment you talk about happiness, it's a sort of a yogic thing or a fuzzy sort of uh, spiritual leader thing. It's not a science just yet. But there is a science to happiness. I cannot attribute to anybody for referencing happiness the way they do. It's because we just don't know enough about happiness uh, on a day-to-day -day basis to be able to make those kind of decisions. Um, so we went to Dubai Mall a couple of months ago, and we asked 103 people if they thought we could measure their happiness. And those responses are quite self-explanatory. 53 of them said, are you kidding? Like, is this a joke? Um, 39 of them said, not sure, maybe there's a way. And 11% said, yes. All 11 who said yes were over 60 years old. I don't know what that means. I'm trying to figure this out. Um, have you heard of the Smart Dubai Initiative? Yes? Show of hands? OK. So you know Smart Dubai is about making Dubai the smartest city on Earth. But we've been working closely with them, and Smart Dubai has repurposed its mission to make Dubai the happiest city on Earth. They want to use technology as a means to an end. But the end is happiness. Technology is a tool. Technology allows us to measure. Therefore, we can impact the level of happiness at an individual level. This is quite key as a case study. And we've had the privilege of working on this for over two years. We launched something called the happiness meter, which is essentially three faces, a smiley face, a neutral face, and a sad face. And we install this across uh, 100 locations. We generated 2 million votes in nine months. And I can tell you for a fact that 4 PM on a Tuesday is the happiest hour in the city of Dubai. I have no idea why. All right, we're trying to figure this out. Uh, ladies' night starts at 7, so I'm not sure. Um, but uh, we want to try and see what can we do with data that can allow us to understand happiness. They're two very different disciplines, but they can be combined. There's two models of happiness. Now, are you, are you bored? Should I skip this? I'd like to keep this very snappy. No pun intended. Um, the two models of, of happiness that we like to regard as being the ones that we want to base our study on is the well-being theory by Martin Seligman and the flaw theory by Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. I had to practice that 100 times to get it right. Um, and I'll tell you what flow theory is. Have you ever experienced um, a couple of hours where you're so immersed in what you're doing that you don't realize you're hungry, you're sleepy, you're tired, or what time it is? Yes? I bet you that never happens at work. Yes? Um, that is flow theory. So flow theory is when things matter to you, then time and other needs start to disappear. The way flow theory works is you need five principles. Number one, you need to have clear goals that are challenging. You need to have focus. You need to, to be doing something that's rewarding almost intrinsically. There needs to be a, a, a feeling of serenity, a loss of self-consciousness, and timelessness. You shouldn't really be able to figure out how much time is going by. Well-being theory is essentially by Martin Seligman, which, is, which challenges the notion of psychology as a disease. Psychology by, by Freud and, and Carl Jung has always been about disease. 
It's always been about sadness and about something being wrong with you. Martin Seligman said, well, if, if psychology can be about the wrong, then surely there's an equal amount that's in the right, that's about the good, that's about the happy. And the well-being theory states three levels of happiness. Number one is what you call the pleasant life. This is where social media plays a huge role. You know, you do things that instantly gratify you. You go and uh, watch a movie, you go and grab a meal. It makes you happy. That's called the pleasant life. The good life is when you realize you've got a couple of strengths. So say, for example, um, I'm, a, I'm a sailor. I love sailing, and because it's something that I know how to do well, I pursue my time doing more of it. So I get a lot more pleasure from sailing than I do from grabbing a meal, right? So you play on your strengths. The third is called the meaningful life. And this is when you have a purpose that's greater than yourself. Now, this is a really deep conversation. I, I do beg your pardon for going into this kind of detail. But when you have purpose, you start to do things that become incidental. And millennials had started to focus on, on, uh, on the meaningful life and purpose. But Generation Z is almost entirely seeking purpose, which is why the type of music consumed by the Zs, the type of movies watched by the Zs are about greater purpose. They're not the usual action flicks. Um, Well-being theory is split into, into five uh, different constituents. It's called the PERMA model. Feel free to look it up. Positive emotions, engagement, positive relationships, meaning, and accomplishment. And all of these are very easy to accomplish, or at least give the sense of accomplishment using social media, which is why Snapchat is so hot at the moment. It's because you get to feel PERMA almost every day. And that's why Instagram doesn't allow you that connectivity. Snapchat is a matter of personal connection, right? Just like WhatsApp is. But on Snapchat, you can show off a little bit more than on WhatsApp. It's a very private conversation. Um, did you know that 60% of your happiness comes from inside you? Only 40% of it is controllable by your circumstances. This is a pretty staggering fact, which means that when a city or, or a destination is trying to delight you, if a hotel chain is trying to, 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 to create happiness, they can only play with 40%. If you're not in a state of mind to be able to feel that, there's nothing I can do to make you happy that will last. And this poses a bit of a challenge, right? So we need to find a way, as a brand, to start depositing these little nuggets to start thinking about your life from a sense of contentment before you start creating experiences that are happy, because then you've already got a stepping stone to go up. Branding happiness is one side, creating amazing experiences. You've got to be able to actually build uh, a physical experiences. Now, you remember Coca-Cola has had this uh, open happiness tagline for quite a long time. That was their principal campaign. Even Coca-Cola has started shifting away from happiness, and now their campaign's called Taste the Feeling. You know why that is? Because everyone's on this flavor of the month, which is happiness at the moment, literally. In Dubai, I'm not going to name names, everyone talks about happiness, whether it's the police, so I said I wouldn't name names, uh, and what a name to name. Um, and then you've got private entities that talk about pursuing happiness through credit cards, right? How do you step back and say, all right, let's, let's get rid of the word happiness. Let's talk about what it means to me and what my product or service can deliver. In the, in the case of Coke, it's about tasting a feeling of joy, tasting a feeling of happiness, but not happiness itself. This is a study that I really do um, recommend. It's by um, Zenith Optimedia. It's called The Pursuit of Happiness, and there's some wonderful data on the Middle East and the priorities of not just Generation Zs, but millennials, but the population by and large on what they consider important. So for example, in the UAE, um, it's far more important, formal education is far more important than having a family. This is really interesting. Uh, there is a sense of, I need to show my accomplishments as opposed to I need to physically accomplish something. Uh, look that up. I'm not going to spend too much time on it. How does a destination make its people happy? The obvious answer is, give them a freebie, right? Another obvious answer is, personalize things. A third obvious answer is, do something they're not expecting. But if you dig deeper, you realize that we should start talking about the base level of delight and happiness, which is, how do we help them lead fulfilling lives, or at least a fulfilling day, if you're going to be interacting with them in a day? How do we help people give their best? How do we inspire them through your destination? How do we teach people to be content? Um, I am quite sad to say that real and virtual tourism are not parallel universes. Tourism 
for Generation Z is one and the same, and it's natively digital. Uh, Nick, I'm really sorry, but digital tourism is a myth. You should think about rebranding. Um, and with that, I'm going to shut up and take questions. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. Let's give a round of applause. Right, so take your seat on stage. Let's just put a, a lovely poster slide up so you know how to tweet us. Um, so, Danish, first thing is, we talk about experiences in travel. So how can we actually design our experiences to make people happier? There we go. Okay. I was wondering what you put up there. Right. Now, let's break it down. You can design experiences as a nation. You can design experiences as a district. You can design experiences as a building or a venue. Or you can design experiences as a, a uh, service provider. So I think, I think the question is, which one of them do you want to focus on? I would say um, there's always uh, the ability to track consumer behavior, right, or traveler behavior. So you know what their touch points are. Because every single consumer is also a producer, we are generating more data per person than ever before. It's about being able to use and tap onto that data and say, I know that a check-in at a hotel should typically take six minutes. This one took 10. Right? Before they come in and say, I've had a terrible experience, we should be able to get up and say, well, actually, this took you longer than I thought it would. Did something go wrong? Can we help you with that? So I think designing experiences with as, as many booby traps as possible to be able to collect data is the key to designing better experiences. You've got to be able to measure them before you can improve them. And this is valid for a city as it is for a, for a, for a service. Data is the bedrock of everything we do. Oh, 100%. So in terms of actually tapping into this generation, we can see that this is a generation that wants to ride with a purpose. They want to be doing something meaningful. They want to participate. Yeah. They want to be part of whatever that environment is. Sure. And digital is how they actually get that fulfillment. Mm -hmm. So my experience of traveling all over the world is that there are not that many opportunities to be really part of that brand experience. You have an amazing opportunity to kind of market that brand before you travel, but now you have something really special, which is actually creating a truly digital experience within a business or within a destination. What sort of ideas could we start thinking about in terms of how, let's say, a hotel or an airline can really leverage the idea of sure. a more participatory experience with their guests? Sure. So I think, um, how many of you are from the hotel industry? Okay. Um, airlines, tourism boards, great, all potential clients. Um, all right, I, I <laughs> sorry, I. That was um, a cheap shot there. <laughs> I think um, I think it's it's important to note that almost all of the social and digital marketing effort and spend in the Middle East has been on preemptive messaging. Very little effort is on the experiential messaging. Right? This is true for tourism departments, as it is for airlines, as it is for hotels. They will do whatever it takes to entice you to get in. Once you're in, you're somebody else's problem. Is this not true? Everyone that raised your hands? I mean, this is fundamentally the model with which we're working. Why is that a problem? Because this is an extension of the advertising model. What is the advertising model? You entice them to get in. And you do whatever it takes. You will take a billboard that takes five minutes to drive by to drive your point home. But once that's done, and you're actually in the sales center, there is no more interaction. Then the real experience starts. Today's generation wants to take digital experiences and make them a parallel experience. So digital is now part of the environment. And I think that's key. We don't do enough of that. We've got so much beautiful data with geotagging, with location data. If we know somebody is within the vicinity of your venue or your event, you could start tailoring messaging to them. And we've prototyped this loads of times. At the Drone Prix, for example, we knew exactly when social media influencers were in the area because they were already talking about it. We knew what we could do to delight them and therefore delight the cumulative 10 million plus followers that we had for influencers. And we did this purely on the basis of geolocation data. Uh, we know for a fact that ISPs within the UAE as well as the region will white label and anonymize data, but they will give you data if you pay them for it to say, how many people have an active 3G connection at an event? Uh, I'd like to know what the demographic information is without you telling me it's my name or my age, for example. And that kind of data needs to be used instantly rather than, oh, we'll use this for the next event. 
yeah. which is the mindset that we follow today. I think you summed that up perfectly. It's tapping into that instant opportunity to engage with people. We see uh, great brands, which have been really disruptive, yes. like Uber, yes. have done this time and time again. They've seen, actually, Correct. there's an opportunity to use their network, use their platform, to create some sort of buzz, to create some sort of happening within a city Correct. there and then. And what I think is that a lot of uh, the tourism industry is not tapping into the opportunity yeah. to not only be part of the conversation, which I think we're starting to really get into the flow of, also targeting you know, our marketing activities as it's happening, but actually creating buzz, creating a true experience that gets people talking, not right. joining someone else's conversation. Absolutely. And you don't have to incentivize Generation Z to create content. And this is really interesting. So um, any Emiratis in here? Two? All right. Have you ever seen the Rashidia geotag? That's become quite a, quite a sensation. Now, you've got kids in the UAE, in Dubai, that are going about creating geotags that are district-led. So Rashidia, Warka, Murdif. And so, essentially, you don't, have to, you don't have to incentivize them. You don't have to pay them. There's no ulterior motive, except that they want to do something that is connecting them to their community. So the whole concept of incentivizing to create content, which is what millennials needed. If I tweet something nice about you, you're gonna give me a t-shirt, right? But Generation Z doesn't want that. They wanna do it because they want the pleasure of being named or pleasure of seeing, like you put in that example, of somebody using their content, and that's a pretty big deal. If you think about it, you know, we, we used to do marketing in, in newspapers with sweepstakes, you know, uh, send, send your postal thing, uh, you get a, a chance to win a prize. We moved that to online. We still did the, the whole sweepstake approach. Upload a photo, win a prize. You know, this Absolutely. is the absolute bulk standard marketing approach. It is. And I think as you've just highlighted there, you don't need to do that. You don't need to drop the carrot in that same way. You yeah. just need to create that experience that will actually create the content. You create that experience by creating purpose, right? And which is one on one of branding. If your brand doesn't have a purpose, it's going to last as long as that generation of management. After that, it becomes themed around the next generation of management. So if your brand doesn't have purpose, there is no way you're going to create compelling marketing which will speak to a Generation Z. I don't know why I pointed at myself, Generation Z, right? Whoever you are. You know, we've gone from a point where we actually realized that the product is really, we've gone to a point where we realize just how important that product experience is. We can't sell something that doesn't live up to those expectations. We know that because of reputation and all the reviews and how that's impacted the industry. But I think it goes one step further now. It's not just living up to the reputation. It's actually creating something from scratch. I would love to know from the audience, and also we can open it up to take some questions now. So who in this room can truly put their hand on heart and say, within their business, they're creating content-worthy experiences beyond the standard offer. Just show your hands. If you fail, you're, you're creating experiences. One, there. one person. Great. Excellent. Oh, you didn't mean to. Oh, she, she's not creating experiences. <laughs> there we go. So, you know, next year when we have this conversation, I would like to see the audience come back and really, you know, it's actually also about being proud and saying, yeah, we create an amazing buzz. We get people talking. Every month, every week, every day, we do something which stands out, and people create and share those experiences. Because actually, that is how we can tap into a new generation that wants to be, they actually want to be part of the brand, but in the right way. Without being loyal in the same way as the previous generation. So they want to do it because it stands for something, not because I like that brand. And those are two completely different things. Well, value for money speaks way louder than brand loyalty or personal tastes. Um, okay, let's, 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 yeah. let's put it this way. The person who raised their hand, I think there was somebody... The lady at the back there. And the lady in the front. Why don't you tell us what you're, what you're doing on Snapchat? I think it'd be great to showcase that. To, I, might, I think I'm taking the only other mic. Let me okay. just run over there. Tell us, tell us about your experience that you're creating. Trying to create. Good work. <laughs> okay. Uh, wellness is what uh, I'm trying to design for the tourism uh, as a package uh, to integrate it with, uh, uh, you said 60% comes from within. So the 60% is what we are trying to integrate when we say wellness, build in lifestyle change, build in actual, s integrate a little bit of scientific precision wellness into the regular tourism packages. So that's very 
very simple that you already have, but not look, looking into like experiencing, ex building the experience part of it, where people actually make the ch lifestyle change. People keep that follow-up change in their lifestyle. And that changes that 60%, the happiness comes from within. Because if you're, and with, it's with the mind-body program. So that's what, that's why I said that. Thank you very much for sharing that. Uh, so do we have any questions from the audience here? Any questions at all? Very shy. Well, I'm going, to talk about, um, I'm going to talk about one experience that I think is really worth noting. It's actually not particularly new. But um, a few years ago, a, a hotel in Spain came out and they said, we're the first Twitter hotel. I remember that. We can, um, you know, we're, everything you do in this hotel is through Twitter. You order your drinks, you talk to the concierge, you check in, it's all done through Twitter. Then we saw a Snapchat hotel come on board. And of course, um, you know, these were perhaps great PR stunts. I think there still are Twitter hotels. But it's a bit more than that. I think, you know, we can safely say this is also really looking at a new generation. Um, I'll, I'll give you an example. Has anyone stayed at the St. Regis in Abu Dhabi? Yes? Okay. If you haven't, they've got this really great service called the butler service. So you don't actually call the reception when you need something. You pick up the phone and the butler is already waiting. And this isn't part of a suite, this is part of every room, okay? Now, what's interesting is that I was with a younger group of people who were part of the family, and they would have rather be sitting in the washroom, tweeting, requesting for a cup of coffee, rather than have to pick up the phone. So although it's already easier because the butler is waiting, that's still not good enough to this new generation. So I think we've got to not reinvent anything. We just have to switch on the listening ears on a bunch of other channels. And that's how you start creating that engagement. So I don't think there is this great big scientific theory around how to start listening. You just have to start listening by turning on all of the channels. And don't keep it part of the call center. You know, the, the, the saddest mistake, when we started representing brands on social media as an agency about seven or eight years ago, the you know, first thing that happened was that we would train the call center uh, personnel to start responding so that we can then hand over and move on to marketing. This is the wrong way of going about it because the call center will never escalate it to the relevant people that will help make that decision and solve a problem. And that's where Generation Z wants to be able to speak to a stakeholder. I know they demand a lot, but you get a lot back from it. And I think that's the change here. So at the St. Regis, if they, had, if they were listening on Instagram or Twitter, I think there would be a, 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 a set of seriously delighted customers who would come back and speak about this. Yeah. Uh, just as an example, but Twitter hotels and Snapchat hotels are now baked into everyday hotels. Yeah. They don't have to be standalone anymore. And we see a lot of, uh, we often see things like this coming on as a sort of concept, an innovative concept to see, you know, to get some great PR, uh, but also to test a little bit, you know, what the value of that is. Great. I haven't yet seen a Snapchat hotel, so maybe the first will come from this room. Um, but, you know, I think hotels can really start simple. Um, so if we take the example of engaging with people on Twitter, the Aloft group, they now engage with all of their guests through WhatsApp. Mm -hmm. It's something uh, that's much more commonplace here in Dubai. Correct. But it's something that they're now doing worldwide. And this is tapping into a generational interest in actually being able to talk Absolutely. in a different way. Concierge services um, in the UAE are using WhatsApp more than they use telephones or emails because it gives you the convenience of email but the convenience of a phone without having to speak to anybody. So I think, you know, Today's WhatsApp because it's private. Tomorrow, if there's less of a regard for your privacy or your, the types of requests you're making, then it's not unthinkable for you to be snapping your way to, to requesting for things from, a, from something like a Harvey Nichols concierge service. Absolutely, and I, I think we see a general shift which is being driven by this generation of moving the, uh, the way we interact with people, moving towards messaging in a really, really big way. I mean, messaging is now on the very edge of being huge. It's, it's about to become huge this year. And uh, we see, you know, likes of Facebook really, really driving that within the platform. It's true. Um, did you guys catch the stat that, was it you that, that placed that stat earlier about how Generation Z is dropping out of Facebook? Isn't that sort of bizarre? It's sort of unthinkable because you think, if you don't have Facebook, then who are you? Right? Do you really exist? Now, I, um, um, you know, I'm in the industry, and a couple of years ago, I decided uh, when my son was born, uh, before I applied for his birth certificate, I actually set up his Facebook account and then a Gmail account and a .com and all of that. And then I started posting pictures from his perspective, you know, as if he was looking at me and making a statement. 
And, and the bizarrest thing happened after two years when we, when we met uh, at family gatherings, you know, people almost expected Aiden, my son, to talk because they had already been communicating with him. Now that, as a prototype, was interesting because I thought, hey, you know, when he turns 12, I'll give him his login details. When he turns 12, I don't think he'll care what Facebook is. I think it's going to become like the A to Z London maps. So Facebook it has a mass exodus at the moment. And Snapchat and WhatsApp are gathering steam, and Facebook is starting to become my parents' generation, right? My grandparents are on Facebook, so why is it cool? And how long can I ignore their friend request? Because after a while, it becomes rude. So I'll just Snapchat my way, and even if they wanted to, they're not going to figure it out, and they won't find me. Uh, so I think things are really changing from that perspective. Now, the last question I have for you, I, I've, I come here as a guest every year. I'm, I'm a guest in Dubai. I'm a visitor. But uh, you really know the market well. So... One thing that I've heard a lot about is when I mention Snapchat, I have people backing off. There seems to be a real caution around Snapchat here. So tell me a bit more about where that comes from. So unlike you, I've been here for 32 years, and I have no interest in leaving, so I'm not going to answer that question. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so maybe you can share your thoughts on that using the hashtag uh, ATM2016 and tweeting us. But it, it's certainly something that a lot of people are not comfortable with, I think, because often people have sometimes misperceptions about how it's being used today. It had a, a slightly dark reputation in the, in the first, when it first came on the scene, mm -hmm. but now I think we need to get beyond that and start realizing the opportunity for I, that as a medium. So I mean, all I could say is that policymakers are always trying to keep up with technology shifts, right? You can never predictably come out with a law that will stipulate the way a new social network or a new app is going to behave and how it's going to connect uh, society. And this has nothing to do with, with um, uh, political leanings. There's nothing to do with that. It's just about culture. You know, places like the UAE uh, regard their culture very, very highly. Right? The ethnic population is under 10%. There is a lot that is important to the ethnic population of the UAE. And Snapchat, when it first started, wasn't exactly being used in the most sensible way by both the expats as well as the ethnic population to, to, to retain that code of conduct around culture, and I think that led to a series of, of events that, that made it a bit of a sensitive topic. But in terms of usage and uptake, it, there is no impact whatsoever. So I want your last uh, opinion, and I'm putting you right on the spot here. What are the okay. three takeaways that people in the room should think about in terms of what they should really do to start thinking about this next generation? Okay. I think first of all, no matter what size of organization, invest in a data scientist. And I really mean this in the most literal sense possible. If you cannot afford a data scientist, hire the services on the go of somebody who can take your data and find insights from it, right? Because there's so much, you know, we've got a carbon footprint, right? You've heard of a carbon footprint? Today, we've got a data footprint. Get the data scientist to figure out connectivity between all of the, carbon, the data footprints of people around and then find solutions from it. Number two, Turn on your listening ears. I, I, I can't say that enough. Brands use social media as a one-off request channel. There is such great analysis available online. We do a social media analysis across Dubai. Across Dubai. So at any given time, we can tell you what district is the hottest in terms of happiest number of people that are using positive words as opposed to an area or a district that's using negative words. That gives you so much insight as policymakers or the government. But imagine the insight that you will get in a hotel where people are happier at the bar next to the pool as opposed to a restaurant on the ground. I mean, you could track this data. So number two is turn on your listening ears. And number three, um, attend this event next year. <laughs> what was the last one I missed? Attend that? this event next year. Oh, absolutely, yeah. I, I think for me, the takeaway would really be to uh, think about doing something purposeful. Think about beyond just selling the room. Think about how people can be part of something good. And that doesn't necessarily mean charity. That can mean creating something. Um, and, and really then engage people in that process. Um, so you have to be a good brand in the future and make people happy and create that experience. So Danish, thank you very much for joining us here at ATM. My pleasure. And uh, thank you all for being here with us today. And we look thank forward to seeing much. you next year.